Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam, how are you? I'm pretty okay. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Anything it's, new? Uh, no, we just finished uh, wrapping up the last of the Thanksgiving leftovers. Ooh. So that's exciting, right? I love, I love it. I love it. Food for days. Mm. I'm done with turkey for the next Mm-mm. few months. I love it. I could eat uh, it. I know. A lot. It's good, like it. but I'm done with it. But yeah, it was a great Thanksgiving. How about you? It was wonderful. Good food. Good yep. food, good family, good friends, good times. Yep. We get to do it all again in a few weeks. <laughs> Three weeks later, we're doing it again. Which reminds me, starting in a couple weeks is our 12 Nightmares Before Christmas special series. What are we calling it? It's the sixth annual one, believe it or not. Ding, fries are done. Ding, fries are done. I know. All right. So anyway. Coming up, though. I know. December 3rd or December 13th is when we start our series. The episodes are usually shorter. They're not as well researched as what we normally do, but you get one delivered to your podcast app that you use, your podcatcher, whatever it's called, every day starting on December 13th through the 24th, every day at 4 p.m. Central Time. And um, it's like our own personal advent calendar to you. So who can use every day? It's going to be more Cam or more Jen because we divvy it up. All right. But yeah, but otherwise, I've got a regular episode for you today. Are you ready for it? Totally ready. Let's go. All right. It was the summer of 1978 in America. The minimum wage was $2.65 an hour. The Bee Gees ruled the pop music airwaves. And Star Wars enjoyed a re-release in select theaters nationwide. And on the east side of the Missouri River, just 30 minutes from St. Louis, was a small residential town of Wood River, Illinois, Mm. where summer activities like fishing, swimming, and backyard barbecues were in full swing. Most of the residents of Wood River had lived in the town their whole lives and considered it the best of both worlds. They had the small town charm with a strong sense of community and safety but they were just 30 minutes from all the excitement of a large metropolitan area of St. Louis. Hopefully it was more exciting in 78 than it is now. I don't know. (laughs) Probably about the same. Carla Lou Brown, age 22, felt the same way. When she and Mark, her boyfriend of five years, decided to move in together, there was no place they'd rather live. They bought a home on East Acton Street, right in the center of Wood River. Now, I've wanted to do this story for a while, ever mm-hmm. since we did the Paula Sims case. So, mm. because the DA is the same person that oh. did the Paula Sims case. But we'll go oh. into that in a little bit oh. later. Okay. Carla Lou Brown was born in February of 1956 to Floyd and Joellen Brown. She was the youngest of three girls. And she was described as free-spirited, independent, and friendly. And she was the type of woman that men noticed. She was a head-turner. A natural blonde with a big, wide smile. Everybody loved her. Reaching just 4 foot 11 inches tall and weighing only 100 pounds, her small stature did not hold her back. Her sisters lovingly described her as a total package, brains, looks, and personality. Unfortunately, that also made her an occasional target of unwanted attention. After high school graduation, Carla enrolled in Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, or S-I-U-E, Go Cougars. And she picked up a job waitressing at the local IHOP, or International House of Pancakes, for our folks not in the U.S. But more than anything, Carla wanted to get married and settle down. She adored her boyfriend, Mark, who was a few years older. But so far, he had been a bit reluctant to make a long-term commitment regarding their relationship. 
The couple had broken up a few times, but they always reunited. And when Mark finally suggested they buy a house together, Carla ignored the Midwest conventions of the day that dictated that unmarried couples couldn't live together, and she immediately said yes. It was the happiest she had ever been in her entire life. But that happiness lasted for a day. On Tuesday, June 20th, Mark and Carla began moving their belongings into their new house while the two guys on the front porch next door watched and drank beer. Mark had two friends along to help move furniture, and later that evening, they invited a few more friends and had a small party celebrating their new home. The next day, Mark left for work at about 7.45 in the morning, and Carla continued unpacking the remaining boxes at 9.30. Carla spoke to her friend Jamie on the phone for a short time, She had another phone conversation with her friend, Deborah. Carla then spoke to Mark's mother for a few minutes, and during that phone conversation, Carla said she'd have to call her right back because somebody was at the front door. Mm. And aside from Carla's killer, Mark's mother was the last person to speak to Carla. Sometime after 11 a.m., Carla's friend, Deborah, whom she had spoken to earlier on the phone, stopped by the house. Deborah noticed Carla's van parked at the residence, but when she knocked on the door, There was no answer. Several other phone calls to Carla throughout the day also went unanswered. At 5.30 p.m., Mark and his friend Thomas arrived back at home on Acton Street. Mark saw that all the doors were left unlocked and was a bit annoyed about that fact. And furthermore, when he entered the house, Carla was nowhere to be found. Mark got no response when he called her name. Assuming that she was possibly downstairs in the living room, Mark and Thomas headed down the stairs. Hmm. What Mark found there would haunt him for the rest of his days. His beloved Carla was on her knees, bent over at the waist with her head and shoulders in a large 25-gallon lard can filled with water. She was naked from the waist down with her jeans lying next to her feet. Her hands were tied behind her back with a white extension cord. And tied around her neck were two men's socks belonging to Mark. Carla also wore a heavy sweater that was totally inappropriate for summer, and it was buttoned all the way at the top. Mark rushed to remove Carla from the water and tried to do mouth-to-mouth while Thomas called the police. When the police arrived, they found Mark hysterical and crying, and Thomas did his best to help give the police information. Investigators immediately worked the crime scene and found blood under the couch. Blood trailed on the floor to the bucket, and a standing TV tray had been overturned. An empty coffee carafe from the coffee maker in the kitchen was found wedged in the rafters. This led the police to believe that whoever murdered Carla tried to clean up the bloody mess with the water he'd gathered in the carafe. Two cigarette butts were found in the ashtray, and there was no sign of a break-in. Carla's body told of the nightmare she had endured. Her jaw had been fractured in two places, and she had two lacerations on her forehead, and there was severe bruising on her neck. The two socks had been tied so tightly around her neck that they couldn't be untied, so they had to be cut to remove them. Dr. Harry Parks, the pathologist who performed the autopsy, stated that her facial injuries were the result of a blunt object and that her cause of death was strangulation. He placed the time of death at about 11.45 a.m., Several hairs were found on Carla's body, including strands in each of her hand. No forensic testing was conducted on the hairs found on the stomach or left hand. The hair in her right hand was determined to be animal hair. Scrapings underneath her nails were retrieved and bagged. Swabs done at the time of the autopsy showed a small amount of fresh semen in Carla's vagina. Although the pathologist could determine that intercourse had happened within the last 12 hours of Carla's life, he could not determine whether or not it was consensual. And it's important to note, again, I know we say this almost every time, but there wasn't DNA testing available in 1978. It didn't come until, what, mid-80s, I think? The most that forensics could do was determine the blood type of the victim, which was A, and the blood type of the perpetrator was also A. And just a little fact, nearly 40% of Americans belong in the type A blood grouping. Not me. I don't know what I am, to be quite honest. I think I'm AB. We don't don't know know. what you are either, Jen. It's okay. I'm special. So in general, forensics at the time had difficulty establishing anything definitively. 
most of the time. Pathologists said things like consistent with or similar to, but could seldom say without a doubt that a specimen matched evidence completely. And today, with modern computers and technology, fewer mistakes are made when matching fingerprints, fibers, hair, and DNA. Thank goodness for growth and stuff like that. Right? right? That technology, I tell you. I know. One of the things that the crime scene investigator Alva Bush zeroed in on was the fact that the crime scene seemed staged. Now, Camille, you might know Alva Bush because you were working on mm-hmm. a case that he wrote a book about. I am. That's mm-hmm. why I was my little ears perked up there. Yep. He felt the socks were tied too neatly to be done in a rush or during a struggle. The electrical cord around her hands was tied too loose, which led him to believe that she was tied up after she had already been incapacitated from the blows to her head. Also, the sweater didn't sit right with him. It was summer. And why would she have on a winter sweater, Mm -hmm. right? The couple had just moved in, and off-season clothes were being stored in the basement. So it's possible that the perpetrator just grabbed something to put on her. Also, Carla didn't usually button the top button of her sweaters. Bush also felt that if she'd been wearing that during the struggle, the button would have either broken or come loose when the perpetrator shoved her head in the bucket of water. So, of course, we know the first person that the police had to investigate was who? Mark. Husband. Right. Boyfriend. Boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they soon discovered that he had an airtight alibi. He was at work all day in view of all of his co-workers. Secondly was Carla's former stepfather, Joe. He, by some accounts, was said to have been pretty mean, very mean personality. And he had also made sexual advances against one of Carla's underaged friends. Mm. They also investigated a former boyfriend whom Carla had dated during one of her breakups with Mark. Another suspect was the town tough guy. His name was Jack, and Carla knew him fairly well. And he'd made sexual advances towards her. He also had a history of violence against women. But all of these men were ruled out for one reason or another. At the time in Wood River, there was a serial rapist and thief preying on women in Hmm. the area. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Joseph later find out that the sheriff was kind of hiding that information (laughs) to the people. Yeah, I think he resigned shortly after they found Hmm. out that he knew and wasn't telling people. But anyway, Joseph Milazzo had convictions for two separate burglaries and attacks on women. One of his cellmates said that Milazzo had confessed to murdering Carla, but when the police questioned Milazzo, he denied it. However, when the police interviewed the informant, the details that he claimed Milazzo gave him just didn't match up to Carla's murder or her crime scene. So police thought that either Milazzo was lying to try and earn respect from his fellow jailbirds, or his cellmate was hoping to cut a deal of some sort. And I hope I said the last name Milazzo right. The investigators tracked down a little boy and his grandmother who saw Carla Brown standing in her driveway talking to an unknown man an hour before what the police think was her time of death. Edna and Eric Moses were going to Eric's dentist appointment and passing through the neighborhood. It turned out they used to live in the house that Mark and Carla had just bought, and they wanted to get a look at it for nostalgia's sake. They turned the car around in the driveway, and Eric saw Carla talking to a man and described it as a, quote, angry conversation. Eric said the man had long hair, wore a white or light-colored t-shirt and jeans, and that he was kind of big. Now, the man could have seemed large simply because he stood next to the petite Carla, and the little boy would have had no reason to understand how diminutive Carla was. She was tiny. She wasn't even five foot. Mm -hmm. Eric said that Carla was not wearing a sweater at the time. She was wearing a flowered shirt. His grandmother, Edna, also said that she briefly saw the man, and he was wearing jeans and a white t-shirt, but that shirt could have also been off-white or light yellow. This was about 10.45 a.m., and aside from her killer, Eric and Edna were the last people to see Carla alive. Investigators interviewed and administered polygraphs tests to the two men who'd been outside on the porch that day Carla and Mark moved in. John Pranty, a 28-year-old unemployed barge worker who fit the description given by Eric and Edna Moses, and the resident of the house, Paul Maine. 
Both men denied having anything to do with the murders. John Pranty said that he'd been filling out job applications all day, which wasn't entirely true. He did apply for jobs, but it was only for a few hours. Either way, Pranty passed his polygraph, and the test administrator said that he had detected no deception. Pranty also told police that he was unaware Carla had been murdered until later that evening when he'd been hanging out at Harold Pollard's house. However, Paul was so upset and nervous throughout the test that the polygrapher couldn't make an assessment. A third man had hung out on the porch for the part of the day when Carla moved in, and his name was John Scroggins. Scroggins told investigators that he knew Carla from school and that he was the one to introduce Paul and John Pranti to Carla. Unfortunately, the case went to as cold as the Mississippi River in February. <laughs> did you catch it? Have you watched it yet I again? Did. Every I did. single I did. episode. So now it's like a game. I play I, I know. like wait to see what they're going to say. If you watch Cold Case File, every episode, Bill Curtis always, when he announces the case goes cold, he'll say, like, whatever state they're in. Like, this morning when I was watching it, it was, and the case went as cold as Utah's western winds. (laughs) Every single time. every, And I'm like, let's see, what's he going to say? So then the episode I watched yesterday, the case went cold twice. And I was like, oh. And then he he let me down. He he was just like, the case went cold again. (laughs) I was like, what? All right, good. All right, sorry. Anyway, the case went cold from there. The two fingerprints lifted from the coffee craft didn't match any of the persons of interest, or Carla, for that matter. Nobody was a suspect, and yet everybody was a suspect. Carla's family felt like the Wood River police did their best, but they were just way too over their heads. In an interview, Carla's sister Donna said, quote, They were good for rescuing cats out of trees, but not murder investigations. Yeah, Wood River's not very big, right? It's not. It's it's a tiny town. Yeah. I mean, I doubt many murders happen over mm-hmm. there, especially before 1978. So Carla's case sat for two years. In the summer of 1980, while in New Mexico on an unrelated case, crime scene technician Alva Bush met with Dr. Homer Campbell of the University of New Mexico and asked if he had any suggestions on how to solve Carla's case. Dr. Campbell was a photograph enhancement specialist and was excited about recent technological breakthroughs. As a result of this meeting, Bush sent Dr. Campbell photographs from the crime scene and of Carla's body. Dr. Campbell felt certain that the TV tray stands that were knocked over in the crime scene photos were most likely what the killer used to strike Carla in the face. And amazingly... Mark still had those TV tray stands, and the police were able to find some of Carla's hair and even some of her blood still on them. After two years, <laughs> after wow. two years, they were completely missed. And what's more, the TV trays matched the marks on Carla's face. Ugh. Dr. Campbell inquired about the teeth marks on Carla's right collarbone. This stunned Bush and other investigators. Without the photographic evidence equipment, the purported teeth marks had been overlooked. The assumption was that they had just been run-of-the-mill bruising. Dr. Campbell suggested that Carla's body be exhumed and the bite mark properly photographed. Don Weber, the assistant state attorney, who would later go on to prosecute the Paula Sims case, like I said, that's episode 164, it was last May, I believe, he made it his goal to solve the murder of Carla Brown. He contacted the FBI major analysis who, our buddy John Douglas. Oh, yep. Uh Uh-huh, at the FBI Academy in Quantico. John Douglas, as we know, pioneered the area of criminal profiling, which the FBI defines as, quote, a technique used to identify the perpetrator of a violent crime by identifying the personality and behavioral characteristics of the offender based upon an analysis of of the crime committed. That's a lot of words, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, to get this, Douglas interviewed several serial killers as part of his research, including David Berkowitz, son of Sam, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Charles Manson, and eventually even Dennis Rader, who's the BTK killer. And Dennis and his work were the inspiration for the beloved Netflix TV series, Mindhunter which they really need to get that back on the air. They're not. I know, but they need to. 
Now, the profile that John Douglas sent Weber of Carla's killer was astonishingly detailed. He said the murderer would be an unkempt white male in his late 20s with a high school education. He believed this would be the killer's first time killing and that the killer was disorganized and unsophisticated. Murder had not been his goal when he went to Carla's house, but had more than likely became enraged when Carla rejected his sexual advances. And that's usually how it is. Like, right? I mean, some of these men get really mad and just kill him because the girls don't want to have sex with him. But see, don't you think that as a killer, they, they that has to play out in their head unless they're really fantastical and they have it all played out that the scenario is going to go different? Do you know what I I'm saying? Can, I have no idea. I have questions. No okay. But no man is entitled to have sex with a woman at all. Or vice versa. Or right. men and men or women and women. Thank you. Judging by the knots used to tie the socks and the electrical wire, the killer had most likely been in the Navy at some point and possibly had some vocational training. John Douglas went on to say that the killer was either living or visiting within a few houses of the crime scene and that he was a frustrated and pathetic character. Pretty much a loser with women. I was just going to say a loser. <laughs> mm -hmm. The killer would be familiar with Carla's and Mark's routines. He would likely drive a Volkswagen, which I don't understand how he would figure that out. Some That's, of that stuff, it, it blows me away. I know. It's like witchcraft, but it's science. You know what I mean? Or quasi-science. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. They said, or John Douglas said that the killer would be able to pass a lie detector test and that investigators had most likely already spoken to him. Mm. After the crime, the killer was probably spooked and left town, but as time passed, he might have returned into the area thinking that he had gotten away with it. Most importantly, Douglas told Weber, that if investigators made a big ruckus out in the papers announcing the discovery of newly found evidence and declaring that they were close to an arrest, the killer would most likely call them out of curiosity because he would be dying to know what evidence the investigators have. Get and how close they really were to the Ow. arrest. Does that happen? Does he call? Let's, well, hold on. You just got to hold your horses. Let's go through this. The killer would try to disguise the phone call as something else. And he would probably say something like, you know what? I was a witness to this crime, but I don't want to be considered a suspect. <laughs> okay, buddy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we'll never that. see through that. On a beautiful June day in 1982, just what, four years after her death? Under brilliant blue skies, the body of Carla Lou Brown was exhumed. While the bite marks were being properly photographed, investigators also ordered another autopsy. This autopsy was carried out by Mary Case, who was the assistant medical examiner in St. Louis County from 1975 to 1988. Mary Case had recently stepped down as medical chief examiner in 2022 at the age of 80, and she's working part time. And she's kind of a legend here in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And for those who say, well, that, might, that name sounds familiar, she worked on the Precious Hope case that we covered in the very first episode of our first ever 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. And we also did a special with Edouard Bird Sosa, who was the director of Our Precious Hope Revisited, the St. Louis Jane Doe, which aired in September of 2022. So check those out if you want to know more. Mary Case examined Carla's body and declared that Carla, she didn't die of strangulation, but she most likely drowned. Oh. She also examined the inside of Carla's skull and found the skull fractures and bruising to the skull, leading her to believe that Carla had been knocked unconscious, causing her to take very shallow breaths. So based on that information, Don Weber believes more than likely the attacker thought that Carla was already dead and decided to stage the crime scene to try to throw the investigators off from what really happened. But that was like, what a way to stage a crime scene. Like that, all of it, the sweater, the head in a can, like... Mm -hmm. the, of water, yeah. Just, I think they immediately walked in and knew that that was not, you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Mary Case believed that Carla was alive when the killer put her in water and then being unable to move because she was unconscious, she drowned. She had foam around her mouth and nose, and that lent credence to that theory. Mm -hmm. Weber now believed that either Paul or John Pranty had killed Carla. They both had motive, means, and opportunity. They both fit the profile by Douglas, although one fit it better than the other. They called in forensic odontologist Dr. Lowell Levine, who is the same doctor who testified at Ted Bundy's trial and identified the marks found on Lisa Levy as those belonging to Bundy. He also assisted in securing a conviction against John Wayne Wilson, the man who killed Roseanne Quinn, on which the book and movie Looking for Mr. Goodbar was based. Hmm. Bite mark evidence is the process of which the odontologist attempts to match marks found at crime scenes with dental impressions of suspects. If a perpetrator bites a victim during a crime and the police have a suspect, the odontologist can attempt to kind of match the bite marks to the subject's teeth. And this was first allowed as evidence in the trial in Texas in 1954. At the time of Carla Brown's case, some still considered bite mark analysis to be good science. However, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has reviewed the scientific foundations of bite mark analysis and found that, quote, forensic bite mark analysis lacks a sufficient scientific foundation because the data do not support the three key premises of the field. First, human interior dental patterns have not been shown to be unique at the individual level. Second, those patterns are not accurately transferred to human skin consistently. Third, it has not been shown that defining characteristics of those patterns cannot be accurately analyzed to exclude or not exclude individuals as the source of a bite mark. Now, that's not to say that an extremely unique set of teeth marks can't be helpful in identifying a biter but that bite marks are nowhere near as unique as a fingerprint as what was once thought and cannot be used exclusively to establish an identity. Bite mark analysis is now widely referred to as junk science. The investigators took to the newspapers to announce the exhumation and the newly discovered evidence of the bite. They hauled the two men who'd been sitting on the front porch next door into questioning once again. First, they brought in Paul, and his story changed from the statement he'd given in 1978. Oh, you don't say. Mm -hmm. He originally said that Pranty had left the day of the murder for a short while and then came back all sweaty and with his yellow t-shirt soaking wet. In this 1978 statement, he also said that he felt like John had murdered Carla. His, you know, John Scroggins, the third mm -hmm. guy that came there. But in 1982, he said that Pranty had been with him the whole day. And while they were in the middle of questioning Paul, Weber got a phone call. Mm. Guess who it was? It was John Pranty. You know what he said? Mm -mm. I was a witness to this crime, but I mm -hmm. don't want to be considered a suspect. Wow, I never saw that coming. <laughs> I know. It was exactly what John Douglas predicted. Wow. Would now, between the two men, John Pranty fit the profile better than Paul. In fact, he fit it to a T. Pranty had been the right age, race, and sex. He'd been in the Navy in Vietnam. His ed education was high school level. He was unsophisticated, unkempt, and he had been visiting within a few houses. He was familiar with their routines. He passed the polygraph, and he was unsuccessful with women. He even fled the state shortly after the murders, you know, and he was the mm -hmm. only suspect to do that. And he also returned. Returned, yep. He even drove a Volkswagen. No way. That, that just it shocks me. I don't me. know. The whole Volkswagen, how do you just pick that I out? Don't know. I don't know. And to Weber, the most convincing thing was that Pranty was the only one of the suspects who had called him to ascertain the situation. Just like they said. Just like mm -hmm. John said. John's so smart. At this point, friends and acquaintances of John Pranty came forward with testimonies of what they remembered from the days after the murder. Mm. John Scroggins, who had seen Pranty later that evening, said that Pranty had been obsessed with Carla, making lewd comments about her body, about her breasts, and what he wanted to do with her, and he kept bringing her up in conversation all night long. Mm. 
They didn't find that odd? I, I don't know. I would think so. At least four other people told detectives that a few days after the murder, Pranti commented that he would be considered a suspect in Carla's murder because he had been next door. He admitted to them that he had been in Carla's house mm-hmm. earlier that day, but denied involvement in the murder. He also claimed that he had seen Carla's body and that she was found in water and had been bitten on the collarbone. Oh, he, he, he saw her body and he saw that. Mm-hmm. While the witnesses often varied on when John mentioned the bite mark, anywhere between 30 minutes to 10 days after the crime, the obvious point was that John knew about and was talking about the bite mark two years before the police even knew it existed. Mm-mm. Yeah. How would, and like, how can you, if you had a friend that was like talking about this? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. red flag, red flag alert. John Pranty was arrested in June of 1982 on three counts of murder. And that's where the state of Illinois allows multiple murder charges for a singular victim. Why? Yeah. I don't know. Probably ask Bob Mata from uh, Defense Diaries. He would know why or how that happens. So he had three counts of murder, two counts of burglary with the intent to rape and held without bond in Edwardsville, Illinois. Don Weber said he would seek the death penalty. Paul Maine, Carla's neighbor, was also arrested for giving false information to investigators regarding John Pranty's involvement in Carla's murder. In 1978, he told investigators that he felt John was responsible for Carla's murder and had changed key parts of his statement when he was re-interviewed again in June 8th of 82, following a meeting with Pranty in which Paul became concerned for his own safety. Mm, well, if you killed somebody once, you can kill again. Hey, thank you. Also during the trial, a former lover of Pranti testified that he often bit her during sex. He had trouble with impotence and that he had an explosive temper when rejected. She also claimed that John had told her one time that he had killed a woman. When she pressed him for the details, he told her that he couldn't tell anyone for that he'd lose his freedom. Yeah, that's what happens, buddy. Yep. She was also not the only witness to testify that Pranti would become enraged upon rejection. Paul's aunt, who lived across the street, testified that she'd been watching her soap operas on the day of the murders. She had a perfect view of her nephew's porch from her chair in her living room. She stated that John Pranti had arrived at her nephew's house at around 9.30 in the morning and left at around 3.30 in the afternoon. And the only time the men had been missing from the front porch was between 11 a.m. and noon. She was sure about the time because her favorite soap opera started at 11. The defense team called character witnesses who testified to John Pranti's friendliness and gentle nature. They also brought in dentists who testified the inaccuracy of bite mark analysis. Dr. Edward Pavlik said that the teeth marks and subsequent analysis were, quote, one step above useless. When John Pranti took the stand, he maintained his innocence and, not surprisingly, denied everything the witnesses claimed. Mm -hmm. In July of 1983, it took a jury of nine women and three men four and a half hours to find John Pranti guilty of the murder of Carla Brown. The judge refused to sentence him to death, stating that John had not really had much of a criminal or violent background. Don Weber argued, stating that on one occasion, John Pranti had threatened to shoot two friends, shot a bullet into a ceiling, sold and used drugs, and spent at least a month in the brig while in the Navy for an unknown infraction. Oh. Still, Judge Romani refused to budge and sentenced John Pranti to 75 years. Pranti maintained his innocence throughout his years in prison. In 1993, John Pranti tried to appeal his case, but. In 92, a law passed setting a time limit for making appeal to three years. Hmm. So he was denied a new trial because it had been 10 years since his conviction. This attempt was based on blood evidence that his new lawyer had said had been overlooked or disregarded, showing that there were both type A and type O in the bloodstains of the couch. Pranti and Carla were both type A, leading his defense team to wonder who the type O contributor was. So, however, since water was used to try to clean up the blood, it's possible that an older blood stain on the couch got mixed in with the new one. One of Don Weber's assistants in the case, Keith Jensen, said, quote, 
all blood types contain an O component, which could easily be explained away. Now, we tried to find out if that was true, and I couldn't find anything about that. I know that you can have an AO blood type or a BO blood type, and hmm. there's something with RH factors, but I know I start to read it and my eyes glaze over and I don't understand what I'm reading. So that could be true, and it also could just be something that the that prosecution threw out. Mm -hmm. Right, the prosecution just threw out and everybody took it at face value. Using modern forensics and DNA testing, Donna Delger of the Illinois Innocence Project stated that 24 convictions and seven indictments based on bite mark analysis have since been overturned in the state of Illinois. In 2017, John Pranty requested new DNA tests to be run on the old evidence to try to clear his name. The fingerprints on the coffee carafe were run through APHIS and were never matched. The DNA evidence was too degraded to successfully match any suspects or eliminate John Pranty. When Pranty was convicted, the truth and sentencing law was not in force, so he was given one day off his sentence for every good day he served. He was paroled in 2019 after serving under 36 years of his 75-year sentence. Mm. But in July of 2023, he was arrested on DUI charges in Madison County, Illinois. Now, I don't know if that went against his probation, like if he was put on probation. I don't know. We weren't able to find anything. I would think so. Stating you, that you he would go back to prison or not. Well, you can't commit any crimes when you're on probation, and that, right, that would but be a crime. I, I, I'm assuming he was on probation after he was left and I don't after he left prison mm -hmm. but we couldn't find anything. Pranty supporters believe that he should have been given a new trial as soon as the bite mark analysis was deemed junk science by the scientific community. Obviously, witness testimony is always unreliable and in truth, many of the witness testimonies in this case varied from each other. They they either differed in what night John Pranty told them about seeing Carla's body or what shoulder he insinuated that had the bite mark for the jury. It came down to the sheer number of people who had similar enough stories of the fact that John knew about the bite mark years before the police did to find him guilty. It was the knowledge of the bite mark that sent him to prison, not the bite mark itself. Carla's family has not come to terms with the impact Carla could have had on the world as she was so cruelly and selfishly snuffed out. She was just 22 years old, full of zest, love, and the desire to live. And that's it. That's the story of Carla Brown. I got a question. Okay, so when John and the, okay, so the lady's watching her soap opera. Stories. Her mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And she looks over there and the two of them were gone. Yep. And yep. that's the time the crime happened. Yep. So where did the one go? Yep. If only one. I is don't it, know. But... It's never Mm -hmm. Your guess okay. is as good as mine. Yeah, it, it could have had help. John so Pranty could have had help. So, but John, don't you think he'd sing like a canary? You would think. I'm, if I'm going down, you're going down with Especially me. Especially if he's been saying that he's been, you know, he's yeah. been. And he's never said that. I didn't that his... do it. He's never said anything about Paul. He's never. No. Ooh. No. But That's it's amazing. I mean, like, if you look at all the newspapers of the time, the newspapers only say that it was a 10 gallon bucket. You know, and mm -hmm. I think they were holding back like the the 25 gallon mm -hmm. bucket. And they mm -hmm. think that that's what, you know, since they were just moving in, mm -hmm. they think that bucket is what they put their winter clothes in to like mm -hmm. move it in. Mm -hmm. And so they just it was an opportunity. They saw the bucket. They dumped it out, put the sweater on her. Why did he put the sweater on her? Are they maybe some they? kind of privacy? They decided to give her some kind of privacy then. Oh. I don't know. I, I can only guess. It's not said anywhere. Because remember, he claims he's innocent. Well, so, But it's amazing how the first autopsy was screwed up, too. And I, I mean, they I missed see, the teeth you, marks. I could see. I could see that. Now, granted, I could see that if she was pretty bruised. I don't know. I'm, and they skipped over the, like, the TV trays. Yeah. Like, they're so lucky that Mark still had them two years, three years later. You know what I mean? Mm hmm It's just... Well, and that is like small, well, small area. Well, it just shows you how they were in over their heads, right? Yeah. yeah. Well... And the autopsy was wrong. I mean, just... All of it. Yeah. But, and I did, we, I tried to look up about the O blood you know, type. I don't, I don't know about that. I had I've no idea. That. 
And the truth and sentencing law, I had to look that up. And mm-hmm. this is what I'll link it in the Show sources. Mm-hmm. But this is how it was ex- explained online. Before 1998, people incarcerated in Illinois prison could proactively earn time off their court-appointed sentence through good behavior and participation in prison programming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overall, these credits could reduce a person's sentence by up to half or a day off for every day in prison. Mm -hmm. The system changed in 1998 with the passage of truth and sentencing laws. Today, these laws limit the amount of time people convicted of certain offenses can earn off their non-life sentences. And it's broken up into five tiers. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. Let's talk about John Douglas and how he knew what kind of car that guy was going to drive. I know. Like I said, it's like witchcraft. I was talking to my husband about it last night. I can't believe you didn't say what color it was and what year. what color underwear the perp was wearing. I mean, seriously. I mean, that's like really specific. Like, how would you know that? It's from inductive and deductive reasoning. That's a statement from him. Well, I'm sure, but like this, out but of all the models or makes of cars, how did he know David Carpenter is. would have a, a lisp, a speech right. impediment? Like, like, how do you I, know that? I guess that's, I, I, I don't know. guess that's why he's smart and we're just play smart That's on why our he's John Douglas and we're not, right? Mm, exactly. But it, it, it like always fascinates me how, like, and he knew what the guy would say when he that's called crazy. up. That's crazy. I mean, no? I could see that. I could see him saying that you're this person's most likely likely going to call up, but to have him to know what he would say, that's startling. That's right. Something. Yeah. I mean, it just goes, I guess people aren't as yeah, different as we think. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, then that also, if let's say if John, Johnny Boy was innocent, had he ever done this before? Did any no. women? I mean, no, he was no just one came forward and said that, you know, he he's he was violent. Like he said that his girlfriend came forward and said that, um, you know, he would explode if yes, he was rejected and that, stuff. Yes, yeah. That yes. he did have an anger issue when rejected. Yes. Yeah. But like the whole thing, I mean, if you did murder somebody and you mm-hmm. left certain evidence like a bite mark, why would you br- t- kind of tell your friends that, then, yeah, I saw her. I saw her at the house and she had a bite mark. I mean, that's not been anywhere in the news. That's and you wouldn't not, know that. Right. The the human eye would not, you would have to have that confirmed unless, unless you're the one that did it. Exactly. You're the one that put the bite mark there. Exactly. So, or he knew, I don't know. That is just plum crazy is I what know. that is. It is. It is. That was a big mistake on his part. So... But that's Carla Brown, and it's fascinating. And if he saw the body, why wouldn't he immediately go, holy Batman, and immediately call the police? And exactly. All of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, because Mark was the one, her boyfriend was the one that found the body. Why? I'm sh- Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he of- told everybody that he went in after the body was found, but then I don't know. And I think that other, I think his little friend has some explaining to do, too. He too much. Yeah. His, mm, well, his you know, friend some of those was people covering like the, for him. Yeah. At least, at the very least, he was covering for his friend. But if you came over to my house and then you disappeared for an hour and then you showed up all sweaty, I'd be like, Jen, huh. what were you doing? I know. Because you, you know I don't me? get sweaty. <laughs> That's why I would be so I shocked. Know. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, it, interesting. It is interesting case. Oh, so. Very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a little promo, a little promo, we promo. We do. It's from our good friend Javier from the Pretend Javier, Podcast. We, we love, love him. When him and we John. tell you, we love him, both. John, when I tell you that I think Javier is one of the nicest people in podcasting, it's, I'm not lying. She's lying. She's lying. I'm just kidding. I'm not. I swear. I, Javier is just no, so nice and sweet. He is a sweetheart. I remember first time we met him at the True Crime Podcast Festival, the very first annual was talking to him and he was trying to explain something about analytics or something. And I, I don't know analytics. You just smile <laughs> it's too and much nod. math for me. I was just yeah. smiling and nodding. He's like, you don't get it? And I'm like, yeah, I think I get it. I don't. Yeah. But he also does criminal conduct with John Taylor for they do two different podcasts. And we actually go out to dinner once a month with John. So, yes, we do. Very nice. But anyway, this promo is for Javier's Pretend, and it's the season of the Stalker, the Stalker episodes. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't listened to those yet, it is jaw-dropping. It Like, I 
paid for Patreon so I could mm-hmm. like hurry up and binge it because mm-hmm. it's it's so good. It's so interesting. Crazy, right? It's insane. And I think really? because I've done two uh episodes very similar to the material that what she does. I think people are crazy. Just saying. <laughs> I, I was coming around to say that I think things things like that, when you listen to it, I'm not going to tell you what it's about. And if you listen to our podcast and you've heard two episodes that I've done that are kind of similar to that, I think people do that more than you think they do. Uh, it's uh, seriously, there's so much going on there. Mm-hmm. that it. I mean, I'm seriously, I binged it. It's it's great. So anyway, listen to the trailer and go like and subscribe because... It's great. Javier does great work. Like, see what he does pretend, he does criminal conduct, and he also does one like for Ponzi schemes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all great. So, anyway, yeah, that's our promo. Listen to it and you'll love Javier as much as we do. Yeah, I promise. Super nice guy. Great guy. All well, right. Even if you don't meet him, he's a nice guy. Well, maybe <laughs> you will meet him. You never anyway. know. Anyway, but yeah, that's it. That's all I got. All right. Well, I 13 guess, uh, days, our Christmas special starts. We have one more episode before, one more regular episode before it starts. So, yeah, 13 more episodes till we get there, till the yep. end of that. There you go. All right, Jen, until next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Fertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at WeTalkOfDreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from Octoberpod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya. Two years ago, an Arizona couple told me that they were the victims of a sadistic cyber stalker. This guy put a threat out to our home and he said, I'm in your neighborhood and I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to kill you. But detectives think that this family made the whole thing up. I get death threats about him wanting to go and blow my husband's head off quite often and it rattles my nerves. I can't take it. I can't take this anymore. And then I get accused of having a split personality and maybe you're doing it and you don't realize it. I do not have a split personality. During the course of two years, I recruited an ethical hacker. I pulled case files, subpoenas, trying to figure out the identity of the perpetrator. Then one day, after handing over my episodes to the police, a grand jury issued an indictment for six felony charges. Things are not what they seem. Listen to the Stalker series on the Pretend Podcast. Find Pretend wherever you listen to podcasts.